This episode of the Golf Guru Show is sponsored by EnviedHemp.com. That's E-N-V-E-E-D Hemp.com. I'm happy to say that Enveed has been my choice for my CBD needs for almost three years now, and I can't begin to tell you how it's improved my life. Uh, They come in three formulas, clarity, relief, and relax. I typically take a clarity drop in the morning with my coffee to get me focused and ready to go for the day. Uh, Some relief for my aches and pains or inflammation after a run or a workout. And then I do a drop of relax before I go to bed that helps me get some of the best sleep that I've had in years. And my whoop band now tells me that it's definitely helping because my recovery scores have been higher than ever. Enveed Hemp CBD come in drops, roll-ons, and gummies. So you can take it however you choose. So go to enveedhemp.com and make sure you use the guru code guru20 for a 20% discount for life. You heard it right, 20% discount for life. CBD is a great supplement to keep you healthy and safe in these crazy times, so go get it. So let's get to today's episode. It's not what you know, it's what you can prove. You know how to cut to the core of me, Baxter. You're so wise, but like a miniature Buddha covered in hair. I want to become a guru so girls will like me. Then I will like myself. Now before we do this, let's go over the ground rules. Rule number one. No touching of the hair or face. Of course. And that's it. Now let's do this. What is up everybody and welcome to another episode of the Golf Guru Show. I am Jason Sutton. Director of Instruction at the beautiful Collinson River Club in Bluffton, South Carolina, and I am the Guru, where it is my mission to interview the top golf instruction minds in the business for high performers in all fields of study. Break them down, get them to share all their stories, best practices, and information that have made them successful, and then share it with all of you so we can grow together as instructors and as people. Thanks again for all of you and your support of the podcast. And make sure you download this episode and hit that purple subscribe button so you don't miss any future shows that are coming your way. My guest on this episode is my good friend, Rick Sesinghaus. This is Rick's second appearance on the show, so welcome back. Uh, If you want to run it back, check out episode 117 for his first interview, which was incredible and was one of the most popular episodes of the show. But I think this interview is even better. As most of you know, Rick is a performance coach that specializes in the mental game and is most known for coaching PGA Tour player Colin Morikawa. In my opinion, I wouldn't classify Rick as a mental coach as much as he is just a complete golf coach that is getting great results from his players. I recently saw Rick speak at the Golf Magazine Top 100 Summit where I think he gave the best presentation of the week and we get into a variety of topics from that talk as well as some great behind the scenes of his post-round conversations with Colin, uh, even from the Hero World Challenge where he lost the five-shot lead, which I think could be incredibly helpful for you coaches and junior golfers out there, which will give you some great insight into even the best and most mentally tough players tend to make mistakes down the stretch. So I was very grateful for his transparency and for sharing uh, the thoughts and processes that he and one of the most mentally tough players like Colin deal with under pressure at the highest level. So I'll get out of the way and bring you my friend, the brilliant and talented Mr. Rick Sessinghaus.
thank you so much for coming back on the show, man. Welcome back. I know we've, we've chatted a lot in the last year, I guess. It's almost been a year since you've been on the show. And then we've connected uh, quite a few times over those that that length of time. And I saw you at the Top 100 Summit not long ago, and we connected there. And you gave a fantastic presentation, which I want to get into the lo- a lot of that information. But thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Oh, no, I, I love it. I was looking forward to part two with you. Absolutely. We, pro- we promised the the, uh, the listeners part two and they're going to get it. And I, I'm really excited uh, to catch up with you. Uh, I know we talked a little bit before we came on air uh, about Colin because we'll, we'll definitely discuss his lots happened since I talked to you. Um, a lot of more wins and a lot more uh, good stuff. But I think it would be helpful uh, to share with the listeners maybe the debriefing that you had after the hero. Right. So I consider Colin the strongest mental player on the tour, right? Thanks to your guidance and what you guys have done together, which is fantastic. Even though as a young player, I still think he's, he's so mentally strong, but it also shows you how difficult golf is and how things can kind of go off the rails, right? Did you guys have a conversation afterwards? Like, like I know you always probably do anything you could share that maybe probably nobody on the golf channel maybe have heard so far (laughs) um, would be, would be kind of cool to talk about, I think. Yeah, sure. I think for for everybody listening, we do know golf is hard at times. And one of my philosophies is we're always learning, right? And so whether he wins the Open Championship, I wouldn't debrief and say, hey, what worked? What didn't? What do we need to continue to do? The questions stay the same. What did you do well? What did you learn? What do we have to work on? So the hero is no different. And I spoke with him multiple times throughout that week. And certainly the first three days, you would say things are good. So, hey, you're learning. Hey, I'm hitting a lot of good golf shots. And then day four certainly didn't go how uh, he wanted it to go. And I think speaking with him after without getting into too many details, Mm -hmm. I think it's just back to the same thing. Hey, did we have a game plan? Did we execute the game plan? Well, the game plan was set and he felt that there was no use of changing a game plan, which he didn't. And the first three holes, he hit a lot of really good golf shots from a full swing perspective. So we knew that the the driver was fine, the irons were fine, and there was nothing there that would indicate he was going to shoot a high score, right? Mm-hmm. Now, we're never into excuses, we're into reasons. And you can look at the, the shot that he hit with the four iron with the ball below his feet, but he also had a slight upslope. And I think it's just we have to do a better job of looking at what that lie was going to do. And I think he just, um, just and he hit a bad golf shot and got exaggerated to a place you couldn't hit it. And he said, actually to me, he says, hey, after he hit his provisional, okay, and he hit it really, really well, he thought he was, it's fine. So it didn't rattle him at the time, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, we move forward to, to six, the par five, there's mud on the ball in a second shot, um, him and his caddy, you can hear talking about, Hey, it's going left. How much we don't know. There's, un- um, it, there's a lot of uncertainty for that for sure. Yeah. And as we, as golfers know, we want to be committed and we want to know what the ball is going to do. And in this case, uh, one of the best ball strikers in the world does not know where the ball is going to go. And, um, yeah, I mean, again, part of it's mud, part of it, maybe he obviously got the club face a little bit closed. And I think that one was more like, hey, there's some uncertainty. But as I spoke with him, I don't think it was a full swing issue. Um, Certainly, uh, he wasn't maybe not as sharp after that. Uh, but I think uh, the concern just from my part as a coach was some of the, the early putts that, that went a little left to target. And we saw just more of a little pull going on that. So that's yeah. something that we're going to work on is, is that a mechanical thing? Is that a mental thing? Um, he felt good going into warm ups and stuff like that. So that's something that we will certainly uh, look at. But, you know, he's, he's a competitor. He did not, <laughs> wasn't happy how everything finished, obviously. Um, but it, it doesn't change that, you know, what can we learn from that particular round? And I think we checked a lot of those boxes. And unfortunately, um, the putting wasn't where he wanted it to go. You get a couple uh, shots. I mean, for him, I don't remember if he's ever lost two balls in, in one round of golf. Probably and you never. Start combining that. junior and golf. <laughs> exactly. It, yeah. it, and then I think... And I think he would probably admit then you start pressing a little bit when you, you had a lead and now you're, you're chasing and maybe that pressing and, and the back nine, you're just not quite as sharp. So a little bit of, as we know, kind of that uh, momentum going in the wrong direction and um, trying to, to, to steer it in another way. And again, disappointed, uh, but he's, you know, he's looking forward to having a little time off and then getting ready for uh, Maui, the Tournament of Champions. 
Yeah, I didn't know, like, obviously it's not a swing problem, right? I mean, I think, it, you know, I look deeper into, like you do, more into the mental side. It's like, did we not have a clear picture? Was there a shot that maybe he wasn't comfortable with? And like you said, in the mud ball obviously probably caused a bit of conflict. Um, and then, yeah, I did notice the pulls and the putting, which I was going to ask you about. So I appreciate you sharing that. It's, I mean, it, it just happens, right? I mean, it's it's not, yeah, exactly. So it's not, it's not something, it's not a dig on anybody, it's just, I think it's always curious to say, to think, you know, gosh, the best in the world sometimes have those things, those moments. And I thought he really bounced back quite nicely. It's just, he just got out of control there for a couple holes and you know, what are you going to do? I mean, he was still, he was still fighting and, but it was, I'm always curious to hear like the behind the curtain of like, you know, what did you guys like talk about? Was there anything that, that really kind of, you know, jumped out to be like, oh, wow, I just, did I have a bad, did he have a bad warm up? Was there you know, did he not sleep very good last night? You know, no. like it's usually stuff like that that kind of gets you and people don't realize. No, you're exactly right. And those are the questions we always do ask is you kind of have your little checklist, right? Mm-hmm. And um, that week was a very, very good week for him. Uh, also personally <laughs> getting engaged. It was, he was in a very yeah. good state. So there was nothing on that final round that was mental per se. Um, Warm up was fine. Like I said, the first three holes, a lot of quality drives, a lot of quality iron shots. And so, um, yeah. And it's just, again, there's some things that happen as we all have as golfers. And when it starts going to touch sideways is how much, how can you bring it back? But, um, you know, like every time we talk, you know, I'm always proud of his insight, his honesty. He's never going to make excuses. And it's it's yeah. time to, we try to just never have that happen again, right? And, uh, and how quickly can you catch those things in, in during a round is, is also one of our goals. Yeah, that that's awesome. Thank you for, for sharing that because I know it's, it's a little personal, which I understand. Uh, let's let's dig back into to Colin a little bit because, like I said, you you had a, a really nice presentation that you gave at the Top 100 Summit, and also appreciated the the emotion, right? Like the the gratefulness that you have of coming alongside something that's really really special in golf. And but you did have a nice little checklist of like what you've what you found special in Colin. And I think that could help a lot of junior golfers out there. Cause I talk, I, I try to like share the gospel of what you've taught me over the last couple of years and things that you're, that you're talking about. Can you go through that list? If you can remember like what you really feel like makes him special. No. And, and again, I love talking about it for that exact reasons, right? You and I coach a lot of junior golfers, a lot of college golfers, and we see, talented golfers a lot. And I know that word's thrown around uh, around a lot, but we have these athletes now that are playing this game and their swing speeds are unbelievable and they can hit the ball at earlier and earlier ages, um, which is, is awesome. But I think there's those intangibles that really do make the difference. And I think that's Colin has had that for a long, long, long time. So we can certainly look at great hand-eye coordination, great club face control. Those are technical skills that he had and he kept developing. But some of those things, like like you mentioned, that I I talked about at that presentation are some intangibles, but I believe those intangibles can be taught and trained. Yes. And and part of that is just this overall mindset. And and I've I've already brought up the idea of learning mindset or or growth mindset, as it's now kind of coined, is... If you're always looking at every single experience as something that you can learn from, first off, going into any event, okay, um, curiosity is one of my favorite words. Um, and if I'm curious about, huh, I wonder what how this round's going to go, is a lot different than, oh, crap, I'm not sure how I'm going to play today. <laughs> and that when people already have the fear mindset and the worry mindset and the anxious mindset, um, we want to flip that with, hey. A lot of things could happen, but I'm curious how I'm going to perform today is a slight different word choice that I think makes a big difference. The other part of that is even after the fact is being curious why this happened. Why did I shoot the score I should? Why did, and that curiosity is much different than critical of I stink, I'm horrible, I can't believe this, right? And that that does us no good whatsoever. And so unfortunately, that negative self-talk, that criticism only brings confidence down. Uh, there's emotional issues with that. And I'm not saying you're supposed to be happy after a round. That's not the point. The point is, hey, I am disappointed with that round. 
what can I learn from it instead of just beating yourself up all the time? So I think at the core, he's a very curious person. He asks a lot of questions. Um, and part of that is like this, what I call a mastery mindset is what drives him is to be the best player he can be and to be a great player. And every day doing the little things that are going to make a difference. And even the little nuances of uh, chipping into the grain and how I want that wedge to be and the release point with the right hand and all that kind of stuff. He's just curious about how to get it done, even if the first repetition doesn't work. But some people are going to give up easy. They're, they're certainly going to just blame it as bad this, bad that, instead of, huh, that ball did this or that leading edge led into here. And they're not really being in that environment of learning. So his learning, his mastery mindset is fantastic. He's always been highly, highly competitive. And, uh, you know, I mentioned the story at the, the presentation where mm. I like to compete with every single one of my students. Okay. And, and most of the juniors I really like to compete with. And I, I just kind of, let's say he was 10 years old. And I said, okay, Colin, closest to the hole from here out of the rough. I, I don't care if he beats me or not. That's not the point, but it's, does he take on the challenge? And every single time he said, okay. And there wasn't an excuse like, well, you're better than me. You're a pro. You've been playing. None of that. It was like, let's take it on. And so he's already looking at competing. That's in his DNA. And he, he wants to win. But I think the competitive juice helps him focus. And so competitiveness, I think, is a good thing. I think it's okay to want to win. Uh, I know that sometimes now it's not about winning. It's about the process. I, I get it. But why do we do a process? Hopefully to get the outcome we want. I don't know about you. I, I know Colin likes holding up trophies better than, you know, being in second place. Absolutely. So those are some of the key is, you know, his curiosity, his learning mindset, his mastery mindset, and his competitiveness um, are there. And the last part of that is he doesn't make excuses. Love that. Okay. That's so, like, you and, need to say that like 12 times. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, for the kids that we deal right. with, that's all we hear. Yeah. And, and, and again, I tell the story a lot where, um, you know, I knew it was a game changer with him too. He's 16 years old, comes back from an AJGA event at PGA National and and shoots the highest score. He, I think it was 84, something like that. And his first thing as he comes to me, he knows the questions I'm going to ask, right? What'd you do well? What'd you learn? What we can work on? Before I could say anything, it's, hey, I did not uh, control my ball flight in that wind. We need to learn how to flight uh, the irons. Instead of, I played bad because of the wind. And then you right. just leave it at that. Mm. That's just an excuse. But you say, hey, here's the reason. We're going to do something about it. And then you fast forward and he will love if it gets windy in a round of golf. Yeah. Windier the better for him. So he's turned at that moment, which may be considered a weakness. It's completely now a strength. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. Talk a little bit about how he switched or how he came to switch to his putting grip. And then... Sure. Because um, I think that's that's another testament to you like and i like i love when my players are like you said curious now you still have to be the filter and go all right let's test this a little bit right but right i mean there, there can be a little bit of both sides there but and then also i would love to know some of the favorite putting drills that you guys work on or maybe like preparation drills for before a round or just like baseline drills if you can share that sure yeah so back to the curiosity i mean being colin's coach since he uh since he's eight years old you go through your natural changes of golf swing, for instance, him getting stronger, him going from a draw to a fade, and and those things, it's just maturity, you, you change things, right? Putting's an interesting one, right? Because somebody might have a putting stroke when they're 10 years old, look very, very similar when they're 20, right? Mm -hmm. There's not the physicality of it different. But I think with Colin, back to, um, he, he wants to be comfortable over a shot, and uh, he's been a streaky putter in his career. Uh, he's been a clutch putter. That's how I define it. Okay. Other people have different definitions when they look at stats. And I said, well, he's, he's won five times, six times worldwide. He's, he's doing, he's doing well in certain situations. So I'm not in denial that there's some weeks that it's not up to where we want it to be. No question. Mm -hmm. So we start looking again at patterns. And if we start seeing putts going a touch short, a touch right, we look at club face being open. We're like, okay, is that mental or is that physical? So put mental aside right now. If we see that pattern on the practice screen, we would then look at it as being more of a physical thing, right? We're, we're seeing that. And so the club face being a touch open, okay. Is Now the grip is the only contact with the club. So it seems a good one to look at. 
And so we've, he's done cross-handed in college. I mean, so it's not new for him to try something else. I think in this case, you know, he's at his club in, in, in Las Vegas and Marco Mira is a you know, member there. And like Colin does, he asks questions. Hey, <laughs> Mark, why do you do that kind of grip and what do you call it and all that kind of stuff, right? Ten minutes later, you know, Colin gets that answer and goes, huh, okay, let me try it. And so back to kind of why he would try it would be, is there a different way to release the putter face through? Right. And by having that saw grip, however you want to call it, it did allow the right hand to go through the hitting area a little smoother, okay? And um, so at first... And you, and you hit it right on the head. He came to me at, at, at L, L.A. right after he saw it. And he said, hey, Rick, I'm going to show you something. Don't, you know, it's like, don't, freak don't judge. Out. <laughs> and I go, I never do. Let's look at it, right? Yeah. And and the stroke looked good. It did. The ball was starting well, the good good roll. Yet it's interesting, and this is, again, for those junior golfers out there, the first week using it at the Genesis here in Los Angeles was some of the worst putting stats we've ever seen. So he makes mm-hmm. a change. He feels it's good. The stats don't back it up. So now as a coach, what do you do? And we just have the conversation. So I just saw four rounds and I didn't see him make much. And um, and it, it, and, I, and again, he's different where if he says he's fine with it, then I say he's fine with it. And he says, no, it feels really good. Mm-hmm. So the next week we fast forward, he's now in, in Florida. And uh, long story short, he wins uh, the WGC event at concession. And he putted, I think he was top five in stats that week for putting. He was plus 0.99 strokes per round or something like that. So you go, huh, that's interesting. And he's on Bermuda, which he's not comfortable with. So it wasn't a surface issue. He grew up in Los Angeles, POA. So it wasn't the surface. It was more that he finally got that comfortable with it. He starts stroking a few. I think it was like, I think he told me like on a Tuesday, Wednesday, and you go, I'm ready to go. And that's all you need to do, right? Confidence. You're not thinking anymore. You roll a few, you roll a few seven footers in, and you go, okay, I got this. And you saw that momentum go for that week. Yeah, he's, it's just him recognizing that I feel good about it. It's just going to take a little bit of time, right? I mean, it sometimes it doesn't happen right overnight, right? So good for you guys to like stick with it and go, yeah, let's let, let's give it another chance, right? I mean. Yeah. Putting so subjective. I mean, it's just, you know, it could have been a little bit of speed control. What, who knows? A read could have been mm-hmm. off, probably wasn't stroke related. So, so what back to the, to the pulls, um, sure. Last week, what did you, did, did you feel like the, the grip got off a little bit or like what is your, what is your go to as far as the, the technique? I mean, we know the face is closing, but what, what do you think? Correct. Yeah. And again, we, we don't know exactly the answer because, you know, it happened on the final round. Um, he's taking a little bit of a break, but we, you know, we looked at some potentials, right? Mm-hmm. And if in his warm up, he uses a mirror a lot to just double check his eye line and his shoulder line and his club face, et cetera, right? We checked those things off and he said that was all the same. So now we look at, okay, what could the putter be doing? So we, it may be a little bit not the hand was fine, but maybe there was a little bit of a setup issue with how the right arm comes into play uh, uh, once that hand is there. So yeah. that may have gotten him into kind of a, I'll call it a pre-pull position uh, already. The right arm gets a little bit more out than under, uh, but it's just right now we'll, we'll certainly work on it. But um, when you see the first four putts go left, you you have a pattern, obviously, and so we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. But, um, you know, kind of back to one of your other questions about drills. We don't do a ton, a ton of drills. Um, a lot of it's speed related. A lot of it is even from a um, starting line standpoint, putting just a, a ball marker that's uh, flat, you know, like the old plastic one's flat, and you're just running it over that. And we're just seeing start line for the first, let's say, eight, ten minute, or eight to 10 feet. And mm-hmm. then the, the speed is, you know, it's an interesting one with feet that how you feel a ball to a hole, right? He's a very creative iron player, and can we get him creative in his in his um, in his putting? Also, is something that we're always working on, and and I think some weeks he feels super comfortable, and you, you see the the success at some of these tournaments that he wins or gets close. That his mm-hmm. his putting's good, um, but I think it's more feel and how he interprets it interprets the putt that makes the big difference. So, so no real structured drills that he's working on. That's interesting. Uh, I, he seemed to be, I mean, like knowing you, like, you know, you seem very organized and then he, you would think that he would be kind of the same way. Does he warm up the same way as far as how he goes about like pre-round? Like, can you share 
like what oh, that certainly. looks like? Yeah. Oh, certainly. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's you know he is very organized. He's very punctual. So hour, hour and ten minutes, he's outside that locker room, and we're ready to go and go to the putting green. And you put that mirror down, and everything's fundamentals first. And so kind of baseline. 10, 12, right. 50. Yeah, you're right. Right at the beginning, he just goes baseline with the mirror. Boom. Right. Okay. And exactly. So it's putting first. It's 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 the mirror. It's eyes over. It's checking a few things. You know, we pick, put them on a very on, on extremely straight putt. Mm-hmm. And you check that off, and then he's going to hit some long putts just to get gauge a little bit of the speed for that day. And you know that may take six, seven, eight minutes, right? And then it's off to the range, and he's going to work there. And then then after that, he's going chipping, uh, pitching, bunker, and then back to the putting green before he gets to the first tee. And then when he's on that putting green, he's going to be a little bit more routine routine based and target re, uh, based. Um, and there's no more mirrors. There's no more those type of things. It, it's now seeing a target. It's feeling that target and getting ready to get go to the first tee. But he, he is very structured. Uh, one other thing that he's added in the last year or so is we're not big. We don't use TrackMan a lot, but he is using TrackMan to improve his wedge play, and he uses it now in warmups. And so that that TrackMan is right behind him and. It's almost like he's guessing distances. He'll hit and say, hey, I think that's 30. And you look at the track man to get the, that verification. Yeah. So we've seen a little bit of change in that. But, you know, he wants to get ready to play at that point. And it's going to be more target oriented. Um, his caddy, JJ, is fantastic where there might be a couple a couple interesting hole locations they already maybe know that day. Or maybe it's a, a win that's coming off a certain thing that maybe may require, let's say, a draw for him off the tee, which is maybe not his go-to. So those are some things that are talked about a little bit in warm-up, but mm. it is pretty structured um, on that end. Yeah, that's great. So back to your to your information on, on mental focus, right? So this is something that I just love, is you say flow follows focus. All right, can you expand on that? And then a follow-up would be like, how do you train focus? Because I think that's the million-dollar question. We may even po- brought this up on the last podcast, but it would be awesome if you got any kind of exercises or applications um, that you do work on with your players. But flow follows focus, I think, is a huge topic. Yeah, and it's something that I've really gotten into the last few years, even though I've certainly studied sports psychology and the mental side. Um, going in this idea of flow, and most people would use the word zone, but flow is an actual physiological uh, response. I mean, our heart rate changes, our brain wave changes, there's breathing patterns that are associated with. So it's something we actually feel, yet from a psychological standpoint, the only way to be at peak performance. Flow is an optimal performance, optimal experience. And the only way you can do that is be in the present moment, period. Okay. If, if I'm in the future, I could either be anxious or worried about what could happen. Uh, I could be excited, which seems fine, but I'm in the future. Um, Or I could still be beating myself up for the three putt I just had, which is now in the past. There's no way to be in the flow state if I'm not in the present moment. So flow follows focus is I have to focus on what is relevant in my environment. And so that's the, the, we would call it the mechanical part of focus is are you paying attention to what's relevant in this, in this case, a golf shot. And so a couple things on this. One, I'll answer it first with more of the technical side of pre-shot routine, which I know you teach and a lot of uh, great coaches teach, is you got to pay attention to what's relevant by asking present-based questions. Like the first thing I always ask from a player, I put him in a, I just throw a ball down on the grass or in the second shot on a par four. And I say, what are you paying attention to now? And they say the lie. I go, great, cool. I want the first thing to be the lie. Tell me about the lie. And they'll say, it's a bad lie. I go, that's irrelevant. Okay. How is that lie going to affect the shot would be a much, much better question to ask than it's a good or a bad lie. So I want people to now say, oh, that ball's sitting down. It's going to come out low. It's going to go low right. And now asking more present-based questions, the lie, the wind, where's the wind coming from? How firm is this green? Those are present-based questions. So that's more the mechanical of choosing a club. And, you know, you do this already with them, right? And you're going to visualize shot. Those are all the mechanics of a pre-shot routine. And I would say most people would say, yeah, 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 Rick, I do that. I go, okay. But then I ask, does it get to the result you want, which is being fully committed to the shot, fully present, fully confident? And then I get, well, no. Then I said, well, then your pre-shot routine doesn't work. Okay. So we got to get out of just that it's pure mechanics of, oh, I do this, this, and this. 
what I have now through the research with flow is why are you more attentive in one type of shot than another type of shot? And the example I gave at the presentation, which I always give is how many of the, how many of those listeners out there have hit an unbelievable trouble shot, a recovery shot? In most part, I get this big, oh, yeah, Rick, you should have seen this one I had here. Da, da, da. And they go, oh, isn't that interesting? Huh, is that a shot you practice? And they go, well, no. And I go, oh, isn't it interesting you pull off a very challenging shot that you don't practice? And then I, I, and I try to peel it back and say, hey, why do you think you hit that show so well? And part of like with, we call them flow triggers, is if, if something is new, we pay attention to it. So novelty. If something is complex, so if this was in the right rough underneath the tree, 150 yards away with uh, bunkers that are flanking the green, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's complexity, there's unpredictability, and there's challenge. And people like to be challenged, believe it or not, okay, to a point. Yeah. And I think the other part is clear goals, which is a, a, is a big flow trigger, is when you have a trouble shot, sometimes the visualization already takes care of itself, right? I'm underneath the tree. Well, I know I got to hit it low. And then I got to head a little cut. And then it's got to, and all that takes care of it. And before you know it, you go, man, I saw that shot so clearly. I go, great. Okay. And there's other types of uh, flow triggers that are part of that. But let me turn the other side of the coin though. You're in the middle of the fairway, 80 yards away, ball sitting up, um, flat lie, middle hole location, no wind, no bunkers around. How many times have we hit that 80 yard wedge to 60 feet? A lot, unfortunately. And I believe that's a mental breakdown, not a physical. Yeah, fall asleep. I believe that's an unforced air. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you fall asleep, right? Yeah. There is no challenge. There's no novelty, no unpredictability, no creativity, no clear goal anymore. And that unfortunately creates now a disconnect. I may have gone through my routine, but I was falling asleep during the routine. There's no engagement. Then you're not focused. So that's part of this process is you can have a great pre-shot routine and, and practice the mechanical part of making a good decision. That's fantastic. I'm looking at full engagement though. You actually want to hit the shot. You can't wait to hit it close. You get, and, and that's where like creativity comes into play. And I think, uh, you know, kind of going back to Colin and some of my best players is they sometimes tap into those clear goals. They tap into creativity. They're creating golf shots and they're like kids. We are in a flow state when we're much more of an eight, nine, 10 year old than we are when we're 30 years old beating ourselves up all the time. Hard to believe, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the, the flow, follow, focus idea is I got to be in the present moment. Certainly we ask present based questions, but I always kind of ask like that follow up, like what about this shot either gets you excited, gets you creative, gets you. Um, and so sometimes in a, in a playing lesson, if I find that good player is falling asleep or disengaged, I will change one of those variables. I'll, I'll change the mm. challenge level. Okay, if you think this is such an easy shot, hit it to two feet. Or, hey, I'm going to beat you on this, right? Now they don't want to beat, they don't want to lose to some old dude here. I mean, and so they go, okay, I'll take you on and they hit it to three feet, right? So the shot remained the same. Their interpretation, their mindset of it shifted. And so that's what I want people to be aware of is, can you stay engaged for those 70 shots, not just go your checklist of your pre-shot routine? And I think you'd be surprised how many shots are hit in a disengaged state. Oh, I totally agree. Yeah. And I think that's, again, it's like when you can start to learn to change that or train that, I guess. But I think from what I hear from you and what I've learned from you is just asking better questions, right? Asking more intuitive questions. Um, and then following up with that is remind us of those eight components of the flow state. You, I can't even pronounce the guy's name <laughs> that, that you <laughs> right. that you learned it from, but it started with clear yeah. goals. And you mentioned a few of those, strong concentration. And then the one right. I was really curious about was the distorted sense of time. Right. So it's like yeah. those, those things that where we, you almost, I call it blacking out, right? It's like you're in such a locked in focus. You don't even remember some of the stuff. Can you go through that? That's, I think it's fascinating. Sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll go through a few of those. Um, so the gentleman um, was Dr. Mihai 
Csikszentmihalyi. Don't ask me to spell it here. Um, <laughs> yeah. And um, he, he passed away about five weeks ago, and he was the, at the forefront of flow and something also called pos positive psychology, is studying what makes people great, what makes them successful, fulfilled in life, and why don't we learn from that instead of just focusing on what's wrong with people. So it really resonated with me. I'm a very optimistic, high energy guy, and I go, man, I, I wanna know how I can improve my own life, right? So years and years ago, I was going through my master's degree and read his book, Flow, The Optimal Experience. I think it was 1990 he wrote that, and since then he had some other ones. but him and then uh, I did some, if you want to call it coaching certification through a, a company uh, with the author Stephen Kotler, who uh, wrote a book, The Art of the Impossible. And he's, I would say, a top five flow researcher. And what you start looking at is those things that Csikszentmihalyi talked about are, are certainly still true. And then there's nuances to each one of them. So back to I'm in a flow state when we already talked about, it. I'm fully absorbed yeah. in the present moment, right. given, okay? Time could change. Uh, we, we all know the basketball player or the football player, like a quarterback, it's it's the final drive with Tom Brady. And he can almost look at the defenders and they're kind of going in slow motion. And he can pick up the, we call it pattern recognition. He can look at the de defense and already know what they're going to do before they do it. That's a sense of a time lapse, which changes. Um, the other thing which I think needs to be stressed a lot, especially with some of our junior golfers, is the enjoyment of the moment. Mm. Okay, so yeah. many people uh, like I don't. I'm not a big fan of the word grind. Oh, I was grinding out there. I go. That sounds like a lot of fun. Okay, <laughs> but but if it's like, hey, I took on the challenge out there, man. I couldn't wait to bounce back after that double and make birdie on the next hole. Right, we're taking it on like we want to. Um, part of flow is you actually enjoy the process. Sometimes it sucks, and part of flow is actually struggle first, but you can't wait to do it, okay? I have a lot of junior golfers, when you ask them why they play golf, at about 16, 17, the reason used to be, I love it, I love being out with my friends, I love having fun, I love, and now it's like, oh, I gotta get a college scholarship. My parents, da, da, da. and it's all for these extrinsic reasons. So flow is about doing it for internal reasons that um, are kind of, kind of congruent with yourself. It's like, you know, I go out there and play golf and and you want to create golf shots and challenge yourself is a lot different than I'm going to go play golf only to have people tell me how good I am. And hopefully I get a, a medal and put me myself on Instagram and tell how great I am, right? Um, those would be extrinsic reasons, and that is actually pulls us out of flow. So we look at being absorbed. We look at doing it for the right reasons. Um, there is time changes going on there. But the word focus and concentration and absorb keeps coming up in all of that, that research. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, you know, kind of back to your, your focus question before is I'm finding a lot of juniors, a lot of college players now embracing mindfulness practices and yes. meditation practices. I was going to lead you into that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, think about if I have to, I have a ton of, of them on my, my phone, but if I just ask somebody to do a, a simple breathing rate, let's say inhale three, hold one, exhale three, that's a very simple rate. And I say, count those breaths. Could somebody do that up to 20, 25 breaths without being interrupted? I don't know. I doubt it. Um, but how quickly can you get back to breath and how quickly can you now um, get back to feeling the, the breath go through your nose and holding it and so on and so forth? The ability is the, to be aware that I'm distracted and to refocus on the breath or maybe it's the relevant question and such. And I'm finding a lot of college players are very open now to this idea of the Headspace app or the Calm app. or And that's great. You Waking know, they're up. being more aware of what they're thinking <laughs> yeah. and how yeah. quickly, if you are distracted, how quickly can you bring it back is really the question. So that's something that, that we've seen definitely with, with flow. Another thing that wasn't necessarily on that list, but I want to, again, go back to is mm -hmm. when you're in flow, it's all about immediate feedback in that I get to in golf, hit a shot, learn, hit a shot, learn, adjust, hit a shot, learn, instead of criticism or critical, which is hit the shot. Oh, crap. You suck, Rick. Okay. Now what? And if you don't go with what happened and what I learned, you have pulled yourself out of flow. It's interesting. In a flow state, your self-critical voice shuts off. So now we're no longer beating ourselves up. We're not like, and so if we get somebody in the present moment and they just see the shot, 
observe it, get the feedback, maybe adjust. That's just, it seems like that's what we should do all the time. But when the emotion and the critical voice comes in and we're bad at this, you're pulling yourself further and further away from the present moment. And so that's the other thing that I've appreciated with with learning all of these nuances uh, of flow is that especially golf, the little white ball's not moving, okay? Mm-hmm. We have the ability to be in the present moment, yet, as you and I know, uh, it is very challenging for people. People, especially the younger generation, is wired um, to where instant gratification and their, their attention does travel very quickly to sometimes irrelevant information. So uh, I didn't... It, tell you all eight, but but when you look That's at all, all right. those things, there, there's a lot of them that you can start applying right now. Yeah. I mean, you, you, I mean, I think the, the important, important ones were immediate feedback, absorption, um, which I would add, and we may have talked a bit this, about this last time, but I think it's worth mentioning is reflection. And you do encourage, yeah. encourage your players to journal, right? I mean, like, do you give them some sort of process of journaling? Do you like give them a little bit of uh, I guess, you know, encouragement of like, okay, here's what I want you to write down or how you should do it. Or is it just about, Hey, take a few minutes and maybe write down what you worked on or what you thought. Like, can you share any thoughts on that? Yeah, I leave it very open. Um, there is another trigger in flow called autonomy is when people feel like they have control over their environment and it's mm-hmm. up to them, it's actually more of a flow trigger. So I rarely will say you have to do this. I will say, hey, here's a couple worksheets, look at some of the questions, answer, whatever comes to mind, um, knowing that maybe in the next session I'm going to ask some of them anyways. So I want them to be self-aware going into it. So I have some very easy checklist stuff, okay? But then there's there's more of those questions that are the basic ones, like what did I do well today? I always start with that as the first frame, okay? Um, and then what did I learn? And then, what, and then I always say, what do we need to work on? Because I want to be part of that team of, hey, what do we need to work on? What, what can I do as a coach? And I think when we frame it that way, it's the simplest way from a journaling standpoint. But when they have their practice, I also have them journal, even if it's two minutes. Hey, this drill worked really well, Rick. I had this feel coming in where it felt really connected and all oh, I'm going to try tomorrow. I don't know about you, but I've had these, these journaling sessions back in college where, you know, three years later, I'm, I'm struggling with the ball flight. And I'm going, let me look back when I played really, really well. And I go, yeah, dang it. That's easy. I can get back to that. Right. And so it's not all about what's wrong. I, I want to emphasize that it's let's learn from what's right. What is that drill? What is that feel? What is that thing that my coach told me that could click me right back in, into, into play? So I, I, I give some framework for it, but I do want to see where they come with it. I have some players who are extremely, open and honest and it's three pages of just you know and then other people just give me some some basics but it's starting that self-awareness that i think is the key no that's huge and i'll give a quick shout out to my son that had an unbelievable fall won won his first college tournament and i think he started to do something it was a daily habit that i thought was fantastic because i sort of encouraged it is a he started a gratitude journal Right. And it was just simply just writing two or three things every morning of what he's grateful for. And I remember, and the reason I bring this up, there is a segue is that you mentioned in your talk that performance precedes gratitude and how that sort of changes the wiring in your brain. I thought that was just awesome. So can you share that with us? Yeah. And and I will get more of the details of the, some of this research that's been done, but Gratitude is actually a performance enhancer. Yeah, that's okay? awesome to hear. <laughs> it, it, um, I, he's become a friend of mine. He's a neuroscientist at USC, Dr. Glenn Fox, two N's in Glenn. Uh, great guy, plays some golf. Um, and he's studied gratitude. And it's an interesting thing when you, you and I have talked about mindset, right? And that's mm-hmm. still a very kind of vague out there term. But if we say I have a gratitude mindset... I am now looking at the world uh, for things that I'm grateful for is a heck of a lot different than what I see where people are on um, on whatever their f- favorite news channel is uh, and they just want to have the frame of what's wrong with everything and stuff like that. It's just we can look at it many different ways. And I think um, gratitude starting the day is a wonderful exercise. And I, we talked about it last time is mm-hmm. the goal would be tomorrow – 
I'm going to jot down three things that I've never jotted down ever. Yeah, something different. Yeah. So now it pushes that and then we're looking for that. And it could be just as simple as, wow, I got a great parking spot. But now I'm open and looking at that there's possibilities and there's a lot of things to, to look at. So yes, it, it creates a different framework and mindset. And I think it also leads to optimism, which optimism happens to be part of flow too, is I'm, it's not that everything's going to be great. It's just you believe that it could get better. And I think that's very powerful. I think what gratitude helps, um, helps serve that. I, I love it. All right. So you mentioned, you mentioned, earlier before we actually started recording that you're starting or going to start offering some certifications or sort of, is that sort of what you were talking about? Like share that with us and then we can go in in any other direction that you would like to. Sure. Yeah. I think that's interesting. It's like, again, back to the, back to the thing that we talked about, even on the first podcast, it's like, we don't all have your brain. We don't all have your information and knowledge, right? We want to know, as coaches, how can we apply some of this information to our students? So I'm very excited about this. No, thank you. And and it's been a long process. Uh, I've tried this a few times and, and now I have a, a wonderful partner in this. And it, it came along because, as you know, as a coach, you can only coach for so many hours per week. Um, my, um, with, with more of my expertise with the mental side, I I can do it from my back office, which is great. I don't have to be at a golf course all the time yet. It still gets to a point like I can only take on so many students and some of my stuff, I believe, you know, can be done in a group, can be done in, in an online format and to get the real good fundamentals in the core from that. Right. And then I've had coaches reach out who, you know, I've been certified in other methods and then now they're coming to me. Hey, Rick, do you have anything to certify in like the mental side of the game? I said, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. And um, so finally here in the next couple of weeks, and this is late part of 2021, is um, something called flowcode.golf, flowcode.golf. Uh, we're going to be and it's going to be both for business to consumer. So that golfer out there that wants to work on their mental game, it'll have a complete program of how do you apply some of these flow triggers and how do you create a, a game plan or a program for yourself. And then also a coaching certification, which is certainly going through the manuals and the and the videos. And you, you'll take an exam and you'll do a an interview with me uh, because I want to make sure that, one, you understood it. And two, how are you going to apply it? And we're creating a community of coaches where we want to get a lot more content out there, do online uh, type of projects, but also in person down the road, uh, do that a little bit more. So I'm very, very excited about that because um, as you know, for me, I think golf is just a metaphor for life. So if we can start doing some of these mindfulness and gratitude journals and visualization exercises for golf, I know it's going to help somebody's life also. And yeah. part of the flow is, is that this transfers into life. Absolutely. So when, when do you think it's going to be available? Are you, are you... Well, we're going to launch. Well, the official launch date is, is January uh, 10th of, of 2022. Nice. Um, you probably, if somebody went on it right now and, and they, they could go around and look at it, um, mm-hmm. it, it would be fine now. But uh, yeah, we're, we'll be full bore. We're having, uh, we've done some podcasts that'll be out there soon. We're going to have a lot more content. And like I said, it's going to be about a community of coaches at first, it, yes, it'll have my name on it and stuff like that. But down the road, it's it's just going to be a community with a, a vision of, of helping golf golfers and even beyond golf with some of these principles. So we're excited to have um, coaches come on board and do their own classes and do their own thing. So it's going to be fun. Nice. How uh, How's your new book coming along? Are you still working on that or is that... Been put on hold by I'm st- as, bu- as busy as you've been with all this other stuff. I don't know how you do it. Yeah, no, thanks. You know, my son, he 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 always ribs me. You know, because I got a lot of balls in the air. Right, we're juggling a yeah. lot of balls, and and that that one dropped a little bit. So it is, it's still moving forward. I've Good. got everything going. Uh, I got a book coach. You know, sometimes we need a book coach too, like we need a golf coach, and keeping me focused on on what I want to do with this book. But yeah, it, it's it's still um, you know we're moving forward on that, and and, and uh, the more I learn, the more I want to put in the book, and then that slows me down. So we'll see. But it, yeah, we're still working on it. Awesome. Look forward to when that comes out. Thank you. Yeah. So one one questioner from from one of the listeners, and then we'll get to any other topics. Uh, before we wrap, um, how early in the process, this is from Matt Rudy from Golf Digest, by the way. 
So this right. is good. Rudy at Rudy Ryder. If you guys want to follow him on Twitter, give him a little shout out. How early in the process do you recognize somebody as a prodigy? And have you ever massively <laughs> been impressed with somebody's upside? And I, I mean, obviously Colin, but I mean, is there any, is there any other in the pipeline of, of players that you're working with maybe, or, and you can kind of go into that first question, but I was, I was thinking aside from Colin, <laughs> who, yeah, uh, no, no, who else? it's a great I mean, question. What, what are the indicators, yeah. right? Well, yeah. And so I, I've said this before, I may have said it on the last podcast, but I, mm-hmm. on, I literally remember a date when I come home, I sit on the couch, I tell my wife, I said, this guy's got it. And that's when Colin was 12 years old. Okay. I, there was something about those intangibles we talked about. We have a 12 year old kid who, yes, had good hand eye coordination, but who is coachable, who is a positive, who is creative, who could, you know, I'm going, wow, that, you don't see that at that age. Right. So I knew he had the mental makeup early. Now we know as, as coaches, talented juniors could go to college, they could get hurt, they could have a bad breakup with a girlfriend, they could not get played by their coach, and their career goes sideways. Okay. So we know there has to be a lot of things that go well for it to all get all the way there. Um, I, you know, it's inter- I love that question because I have now looked back at other juniors that I've worked with, some with swing, some with mental, some with both or whatever, and trying to follow along. And there was a couple girls, one that I worked with um, who was like top 10 in AJGA and, and Rolex and um, and I, I saw her when she was like 12 or 13, and you just saw the physicality of somebody who could take over, and she had a, a great mindset, and um, uh, I believe she just graduated pl- from playing high-level D1. Um, so th- there's some of those, um, but I think, you know, I look back, did I, did I get somebody wrong, you know? And, and so often, I don't think I've just said, yo, you know, other than Colin, I honestly haven't told anybody like, hey, you got to watch yeah. this person. I've just said, hey, I've got some good players right. and I've got a couple college players that I'm working with now that I believe will tran- their game will translate to the next level. And I think that's the key thing is when we, we talk about these different levels, certainly there's physical part. I know everybody wants to hit the ball really, really far and I go, great, but there's so many different conditions that you have to play in at these different levels. And then mentally, can you deal with the ups and downs? Can you deal with being a- alone on the on the road? Can you deal with missing cuts? I mean, yeah. some of that stuff doesn't is not dealt with in college as much because the college coach is doing all your travel and you're if you play poorly, you're still with your buddies and yeah, there that's part of that mindset thing that that keeps going um, with that. And I think the other thing, and this is just a complete bias on mine, is that the ones that I tend to look at at a young age who love to play more than practice. Mm. Now, some people say, yeah. well, you got to practice hard. I go, I get it, but you want to play. You want to learn how to yeah. play. You want to hit different shots. You want to get out there. And you know. And so that's a thing that I, I think we have to be careful in our industry that it's it's just not practice, 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 get my track man numbers at zeroed and, and do all this stuff. I think there's there's we're, we're missing something in that. And so I look at the player not just as... Um, you know, did that shot look beautiful, but what was their mindset behind it? How did they react to it? Do they, and, and those are the things that I believe happens more from playing the game. <clears throat> yeah, it was interesting. I don't know, were you in the room when Bryson did his interview at the top 100? Yeah. Yeah, which, it was, that was, was fascinating. Un- yeah, right? I was just saying that, that was fascinating because currently he's, he's, using a lot of block practice, trying to hit one shot, as he said, trying to hit the perfect shot. But then he pre- prefaced that by saying, hey, look, when I was a kid, all I did was play, right? I learned all the shots. I could hit all the shots. I can still hit all the shots. So he he didn't say like he's always been in that mindset of block practice or trying to hit it far. Like you have to build those skills first. So going back to your point, I think that's a that's a great that's a great way to think about it. I think it, you know, like we say always, su- success leaves clues, right? So after you've coached somebody like Colin, or you start seeing more, then you have that ability to look back, right, and say, okay, what made him great, right? So then you can start to look closer when you see kids come through the pipeline and go, okay, well he kind of has this, and then you know, so it, I mean, obviously twenty, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but 
I think a lot of it is after we've seen some really good kids, then you can look back and go, this is what made him great. So you're going to, like you, like you said, I think you put it perfectly is, you know, he's going to change the game for the better because of who he is, not Mm -hmm. because of all his results, you know, and he has that platform now because of his his results, but he's going to help so many kids, I think along the way. And and let me go back to kind of the question is like, can we, can we see that level of player, you know, getting to another level or something like that. I, I, what popped in my head was it's easy for us to say, okay, they just shot 68. Obviously they're a good player, but I sometimes am now looking at the other thing of what would interfere with the development, right? That's a word that I use a lot is developing. Yeah. Somebody shot 68 when they're 16 years old, they think that's just an an easy transition that they're going to do this, this, and this, that doesn't always happen. Right. So then I look at, well, what are those stumbling blocks, the interference that might stop somebody's development? And that one is an interesting one because you, you, Bryson does things completely different than Colin and they're world-class players. I would never tell Bryson he has to do what Colin or vice versa because Bryson in that said he does that to uh, be confident, right? That was a, in a way, how he trains confidence. I'll just do the same thing over and over again. I'll know what I'm going to get. Confidence is a skill, right? That's right. Other players may say, hey, I'm going to try all kinds of different shots. So no matter what comes my way, I'm prepared for those. That's confidence also. And I think we, of course, need a little bit of a balance of both. But if we looked mm-hmm. at what interferes with performance, uh, again, I'm going to go bias here. Um, I'm seeing a lot of players trying to be perfect in golf swings. They're trying to um, have an Instagram swing and all that stuff. And um, I think it is getting in the way of them developing as players. Uh, completely agree. Completely agree. And that's, I mean, we talked about this last time as I'm moving more or trying to improve my coaching side, right? So it's like having that balance as a coach and a teacher now knowing when to switch and knowing when to do things. I think that's just the genius part of the coach, which I can't, I don't know that you can tell people because every, every situation is different. right. So you got to know who's in front of you, right? So you got to know when you're, when you're talking to Bryson, you're not going to treat him like a Colin, you know I mean? Hopefully you're smart enough to do that. Um, That's, it goes back to the, the whole, you know, EQ versus IQ conversation. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's, that's the list you got to look at is like, what are the roadblocks to success? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and back to kind of that interference, mm-hmm. right? If we have that 16 year old who then goes to an AJGA event and, um, they play quite poorly, right. And everybody expected them to do this is now, how are they bouncing back? Right. Mm-hmm. Do they go sideways with it? Or they say, Hey, I'm going to get better from it. Those are those little things along the road that, you know, how are they steering that I think becomes important. And, you know, not to just talk juniors, but just as they get into college, there's more potential distractions, there's more potential interferences, they get on the road, you know, you get a lot of these um, young pros and it's like, hey, they don't have much money that they're, now they're grinding about money. I mean, there's so many things that could get them out of just playing in the state that they need to for that round of golf. And, you know, do they have those skill sets to do it um, cannot always be seen when they're 14. It may be, you see how they deal with a, a, a bad shot every now and then. Okay. But it starts escalating and, you know, do they have those skills later on, of course, is what we're looking at. Absolutely. So how many opportunities have you had to, you don't have to name names, opportunities to join other teams as just the mental coach for other players now? Um, yeah, a few, uh, not, not really on the PGA tour. I'm not, um, honestly looking to be on anybody's team on the PGA tour. Um, I feel I'm on a pretty good team right now. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean, though, uh, like, to, to expand uh, your totally. stable. Totally, totally. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I, I've been fortunate. To, uh, I work with a few players on the LPGA Tour. And and my, you know, really what I love working on with is juniors and college players. Um, I, I feel that giving them some of these um, these skills early on builds up to that point. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of if I'm brought in to fix something. Um, I'm more about developing something. And I get it in this day and age. Hey, you, you need to make a cut. You need to do that. You know, give me the magic words, Rick, and I'll do them. But I think it's more of the development and these are skill sets that we want to go with. So, um, yeah, I've been very fortunate. Again, people have been reaching out and and, and that's the other part of why with the, the flowcode.golf is 
to get that information out there more for people to get a good baseline on that and um, and then uh, kind of go from there. But um, yeah, I, I, my business is expanded. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're so good at deflecting. <laughs> I love it. Awesome, man. Well, is there anything, other topics that you want to talk about before we wrap? I mean, I appreciate your time and I think we probably should do this once a month because I think it's just fantastic. <laughs> yeah, no, I, and I think, you know, back to us as coaches, you know, I, I, it was, it was a, it was a privilege to, to be able to speak to the top 100 uh, coaches and yeah. being around that energy, right. The, the thing that I learned early on, um, maybe not early enough, but, you know, in my 20s, I thought I knew everything about golf coaching. I thought I knew all the positions and all this kind of stuff. I'm 50 years old now. And it's more of the, when you're in the environment of great coaches, you realize how much you don't know. And that can be humbling. And yet it also is a reminder like, wow, we got so much cool stuff to learn. And we have so many people that we we can learn from. And so I appreciate you, you, you know, inviting me on the, the podcast to at least share some of my information, but I am always looking from other people to say, Hey, I didn't know that. Or, and that's why I was picking people's brains when I was, when I was there, because everybody has their own filter as coaches right. of what they're looking for. And I always use the word bias because I do what, know what my biases are. Okay. I believe the mental game is more important than mechanical. That's my bias. Other people are going to say the exact opposite. That's fine. But I know what my framework is. And so I, I, I just enjoy being around people who want to learn and who kind of has that passion for it. And so I, I love being around you and we're, we're talking and stuff like that. And, and yeah. I think that needs to happen even for us golfers who are learning the game is to be passionate about the learning process of it. Absolutely. So tell the listeners how they can get a hold of you, how they can say hello, give them your socials. Sure. And, and your website. Yeah, all my socials, and I don't do a ton on social. Every now and then I'll post something, but you need to, uh, you need to put name. a little bit more out on on Twitter and, and I know. Uh, Instagram. I gotta get you going with that, <laughs> like you have the time, right? <laughs> well, yeah, and, and, and I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll start doing more. Twenty twenty two, right? Um, there you go. Yeah, my, so it's my full name, Rick Sessinghouse, um, on all the on the, all the social. Um, you know, sometimes I'll post some stuff that we're working on with Colin at some of the events, especially the majors. I think that's fun. Um, and then some of the projects that I'll be working on, I'll certainly go out there. And then my website's my full name, ricksessinghouse.com. And then the, the new uh, project that is going to be launching here um, at the start of 2022 is um, flowcode.golf. And uh, looking forward to getting feedback on that from, from the golfers out there. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for your time as always. And you're the best, man. Keep doing what you're doing. Appreciate it. Thank you. What's up, everyone? Guru back here again with a couple of things before you go. A uh, big thank you to Rick for coming on the show and sharing his story and his incredible knowledge and insights on the mental side of golf and really sharing his story about life and also his work on the PGA Tour, which is super cool. Uh, make sure you give him a, a follow on the gram at Rick Sessinghouse and check out his website at ricksessinghouse.com and then give him a social wave. Tell him thank you for coming on the pod. Uh, thank you again to our sponsors, Straight Down Apparel for making me look good and envyedhemp.com and Swing You. When you go buy your CBD needs, mbhemp.com make sure you use the promo code guru20 for a 20 percent discount for life you won't be disappointed also make sure you go to the app store and download my golf guru app appreciate that and give me a follow and reach out to me on twitter and instagram at golf guru tv if you have a question about anything and want to reach out golf guru show at gmail.com is the way to go or just hit me up on the dm also check out my website at golfgurutv.net and make sure you leave your email at the bottom of the website so you can be included in my weekly newsletter where you can get some additional content, uh, videos, and another link to the podcast, which you've already found. Music on this podcast is brought to you by Kevin McLeod and Zach Mullet. And then as I always leave you with the mantra that I try to live my life by, Make sure you study, make sure you practice, make sure you teach, and then make sure you, more importantly, pass it on to somebody. I'll talk to you next time. Thank you so much for listening.